do you see the Lamb? The Lamb was the one on the cross who died for our sins so that we might be saved, so that we might be redeemed, we might be justified, so that we can come and we can worship at His table. Are you looking for meaning or a word from God that's relevant to your life? Are you searching for a better understanding of who God is? Well, you're in the right place. You found the Gary Talks About God podcast. This is a weekly podcast that comes to you from the pulpit of Red Bank Missionary Baptist Church in Germanton, North Carolina. The podcast is hosted by Red Bank Senior Pastor Gary Sanders. Now let's get ready to take that walk through God's Word with our pastor, teacher, and friend. Hey, he's that guy we call Gary. This morning, if you have your Bibles, we're in Genesis chapter 22. It is not a stretch to say that Genesis 22 is one of the most uh, theologically significant chapters of the Bible, as well as one of the most perplexing and confusing chapters of the Bible. For those of you that have headings in your Bible, it says the sacrifice of Isaac, which is a bit of a misnomer because, thankfully, in the end, Isaac is not sacrificed. It should be... Uh, God's command to sacrifice Isaac might be a little bit better. But we read through it and we don't, we get to the end and we just kind of scratch our heads and say, what is going on here? Why is God including this in his word? Why would God do this? And there's a very, very important reason why he's doing this. But I'm going to have to ask for your patience because it's going to take us to get through the first three points of the the sermon this morning to get to the last one that helps you see why God commanded uh, Abraham to do these things. So let's read chapter 22 and then dive into God's word this morning. It says, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they both went, of them, they both went together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and he took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sand on its seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went to Beersheba, And Abraham lived at Beersheba. This morning, as we walk through this chapter, just four points to kind of guide and lead our study. And the first one is this. It's very simple. God's command. As we have been reading through Genesis, we are not surprised at the very beginning of Genesis 22 for God to speak. We have learned that God is a God who speaks. 
nor are we surprised to hear Abraham respond. We have watched him respond to leave Ur. We have watched him respond to God as he went and fought the kings. We saw him respond to God as he tithed Melchizedek, as he interceded for Sodom, as he walked through the land. We're not surprised by God speaking, nor are we surprised by Abraham responding. What catches our attention is the command that God has given Abraham. There is nothing in Abraham's history with God, nor with our reading of God's word to this point, that prepares us for what God says. Go sacrifice your son. For as much as verse 1 is is normal and plain, and and we almost expect it, there is nothing that prepares us for verse 2. It's like a sledgehammer to the senses. And we read that and we go, God, you can't be serious. Because we think of what we've learned up until this point, right? Genesis 1 teaches us that God created us in his own image. We learned in Genesis 4 that when Cain murdered Abel, the blood of Abel cried out from the ground. We saw in Genesis 9 that God says he's going to require a reckoning from a person if a person sheds the blood of someone else. So there is nothing that remotely prepares us for this command. There is nothing that we read here that we think this is within God's character. It is discordant to all that we have learned. And it's not bad enough that God just gives the command, but look at what he does as he gives the command. He says, go sacrifice your son Isaac. And then he just starts almost like he's just piling on. I want you to go and take your son, but not just any son, your only son. And not just your only son, but the son whom you love. The one who is the heir to the covenant. The one who everything will come uh, to pass through him. So that if he dies, all the promises die as well. And I don't want you just to go and offer him as a sacrifice. Go and offer him as a burnt offering. Which means that after you kill him, you place him on the altar with the fire. And that everything is consumed. So in essence, there's nothing left of Isaac. He would just be a memory, for there would not even be a body to bury. This is what God tells Abraham. And we go back and we read verse 1. God says, Abraham, and, and Abraham says, here I am, Lord. And we go, this is the answer to the here I am, Lord? Makes a lot of us, when God says our names, not to respond with here I am, Lord. But that's what he tells him to do. And we're indignant, and we should be. I mean, we, we try to rationalize the text. We try to look for that loophole. We, we try to look for, for anything to, to make this not true. And the fact that we're told in verse 1, if you read carefully, it says God tested Abraham. We, we read that and we understand, but we don't really care by the time we get to verse 2. Test him by telling him to go somewhere else. Test him by telling him to fight kings. Test him by by telling him to, to go build a house in the middle of a pagan culture. Test him by telling him to build a temple. There is any a myriad of ways, God, that you can test him. But we know it's a test, but we still don't like it. Don't tell him to go and offer and sacrifice his son. But that is God's command. That is what God commands him to do. And as he commands him to do that, we secondly, we see Abraham's obedience. We see that in verses 3 through 10. If we don't like what God has commanded Abraham to do, you can rest assured that Abraham doesn't either. So, so what is he to do? What, what would you do? Honestly, if it was me, I would probably test David's theory. Remember David, he writes the psalm, where can I go to escape your presence? If I go into heavens, you're there. If I descend to Sheol, you're there. If I go to the depths of the sea, you're there. If I go to the heights of the mountains, you're there. I know David hadn't written that psalm yet in Genesis 22, but I'm going to put that into test. God, I'll sacrifice him if you can find me. You know, I, I just, I don't want to deal with it. But we read the text, and we see what Abraham does, and it's surprising. Because we're told in great specificity exactly what he does. Look at what he does. He says, he got up early in the morning. He got up early. He goes out, and he cuts the wood. He, he takes Isaac. He, he's, he's making all the preparations to do exactly what God commanded him 
to do. Then he tells two of his servants, hey, let's go. And the four of them set off. Abraham, Isaac, his two servants, a donkey, the wood, the fire, the knife, everything to be obedient to God's command. And he does this all in silence. Do you know that he doesn't respond back to God after the here I am? It's almost like he said the here I am was enough. I don't want to say anything else. Who knows what else God's going to tell me to do. We don't really know what he is thinking. We have no indication of his internal thought process. But we see in him what looks like obedience. And as we read that, we're kind of... Are you confused by what he does? I'm a little confused. Is is he delusional? I I, I mean, is he crazy? Or is there a a deep-seated faith in God that at this point... We're not seeing. But he obeys. He starts to do exactly what God tells him to do. And he begins the journey. And he's got to make the journey for three days. Now this is is important. This is an important detail. This is one of those things you just read and you think, oh, it's just a three-day journey. That's how far it is. And we kind of overlook at, look the significance of that. And it's really important, and I know some of you think, well, Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days, and Jesus was in the tomb for three days. And, and so we, we've, we've learned, and we will see again at the end, that Genesis kind of prepares us to look for things. And I'm not discounting that, but I think there's a, a, a different reason as well. Think of it this way. Why did God... Say, Abraham, take Isaac and go 25 feet outside of camp in 20 minutes and sacrifice Isaac right outside the camp. Why didn't he give him that command? I think the best way that you can understand it is through an analogy that we've all been through. How many of you as a kid, as an older child, so you you could think through it, had to take a liquid medicine that was nasty? It's like they specifically decided to make this the worst foul-tasting thing that they could possibly come up with. You know, and they're giving it to the kids in, in the testing room, and they're like, oh, no, not the reaction we wanted. Let's add some more gross stuff to it, right? So you know you've got to take this medicine, and you know how bad it tastes, but at the same time, you know that if you don't take it, you're not going to feel better. So you've got a dilemma. You can either try to put it off and put it off and put it off for as long as possible and therefore make it worse, or you could just take it as quickly as you can without much thought just to get it down. Now, I imagine most of us do that last one, right? We just decide, all right, I got to do this, so pour in the spoon and it's done. We want it over in three seconds so that we don't have to think about what's going on. Because if we do it just that immediately, It's not that bad. We're acting out of impulse. And the same is true for Abraham. God does not want Abraham to simply act out of impulse, to do something he doesn't want to do just to get it over with. God is working in his life to develop his faith. And these three days are three days of struggle for Isaac. And I know that that sounds, it, it, it kind of sounds a little bit sadistic, doesn't it? That God's just, just tormenting Abraham. But he's not. He has given Abraham a way to grapple with two very distinct truths. Truth number one, God told Abraham, all the future generations will be blessed and will flow through Isaac. He is the son of promise. The promise continues through Isaac. So that's truth number one. Truth number two is God told Abraham to sacrifice the one through whom all the future promises would flow. So he has got to grapple and deal with these truths, and it's going to take him more than a 25-foot step outside of camp to come to a point in his his thinking and interacting with God and, and thinking through what God is telling him to do and the truths God has promised so that he can get to a point where he knows what's going on. One person wrote it uh, this way. The three days, quote, tended to make him persevere so that he should not obey God by merely a sudden impulse. It hence appears that his love to God was confirmed by such constancy that it could not be affected by any change in the circumstances. So during those three days, he is persevering and he is wrestling with God and he is fighting with God and, and he is 
pleading with God and trying to understand. And he needed those three days to work through the commands that God had given him. To understand at some level what God is planning to do. So he walks for those three days. And he finally arrives at Mount Moriah. And it says, they come to the place in verse 9 where God had told him. And we're going, or excuse me. They, they come, it says, in verse th- 4. On the third day they arrive. They're there. And so we're reading it. All right, what's he going to do now? He's had these three days. He's struggling. Where did he end up in the struggle? And we read, he tells his servants, hey, pitch the camp here. Make the tents, make the fire. And then he says... One of the most astounding statements in all of Scripture. Verse 5. Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And that is plural. He is saying that Isaac and I, we will come back to you. Both of us. Now that statement is stunning on so many levels and, and the focus is usually and rightfully so on, on the end, but the first part is no more, no more stunning to read. Because what does he say that he and Isaac are going to go do? They're going to go worship. He is calling God's command to go and sacrifice Isaac an act of worship. Now we've seen Abraham worship before, right? We've seen him build an altar. We, we've seen him plant a tree, we've seen him pay a tithe, we've seen him call on the name of the Lord. We have seen him worship, and here in this context, he is saying the command of God to go and offer Isaac as a burnt offering is a command to go and worship. So he looks at his servants and says, Isaac and I, we're going to go worship the Lord. And we're going, I can think of a whole lot of ways that I would rather worship the Lord than being obedient to that command, God, that you've given me. But here's, here's Abraham. He's going to worship. And the second part tells us that it appears that Abraham has resolved the conflict. He's resolved the conflict. He says, we're coming back. He has placed an absolute trust and faith in God that he believes Isaac will walk up the mountain with him and Isaac will walk down the mountain with him. Even though in between the walk up and the walk down is the sacrifice. And as we read Genesis, we don't quite understand how Abraham has resolved this. But somehow in his mind, he has. Thankfully for us, we have Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 through 19. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac... And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up Isaac, his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Verse 19 tells us how Abraham resolved the conflict during those three days of travel. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham ends up in a place where, again, I don't know. We talk about so much, so many times, put yourself in Abraham's place, or put yourself in David's place, or put yourself in Job. We, we always say, put your, yourself in, in the Bible character's places, and I, I don't like doing that because I'm not a Bible character. I'm going to fail more times than not. I don't know if I was put into Abraham's place for three days, if this is where I end up. Saying that I have such great faith and trust in God that the promises will continue through Isaac. That even if I do sacrifice him and offer him up as a burnt sacrifice, then God is going to raise him back from the dead while I'm on top of that mountain so that he can walk back down with me. But that's exactly where Abraham gets to. It says, because he has figuratively already received him back from the dead. How did he receive him back from the dead? Well, remember, Sarah's womb was closed, and her womb was dead, and God opened up her womb and, and, and gave her Isaac. And so Isaac was, figuratively speaking, brought from the dead because Sarah's womb was dead. So if God could do it once, God can do it again. 
And this is one of those passages where you take Genesis 22 and, and you couple it with Hebrews 11 that really forces us to examine the truth claims we say we believe. Right? You know, if, if we believe that God is all-powerful, He can do anything. If we believe that God is all-knowing, that He knows everything, even to the, the thoughts in our hearts, if we believe that the Bible is God's inspired and errant word given to us, and that everything is true, then we come to this conclusion that God was able to see, even though it wasn't revealed in Genesis 22, but Abraham's thought process and what he was thinking through in Genesis 22 to reveal it to us in Hebrews 11. So at the end of the three-day journey, the only way that Abraham was able to resolve these two apparently contradictory truths was that God would have to raise Isaac from the dead. Because the promise is only going to come through Isaac. So Isaac must live even if he is to die. And we think, man, that's great faith. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see that faith in Abraham. But at the same time, he still got to go through with the sacrifice. Which is why we read he places the wood on Isaac. He, he, he put it on him and said, Isaac, let's go. And Isaac has worshipped with his dad enough to know that this is normal. He knows that a normal part of worshipping God is to make sacrificial offerings. And to make those offerings, you need wood, you need fire, and you need a knife. So Isaac carrying the wood, which apparently maybe he's done before, and his dad carrying the fire and the knife, nothing is unusual about this. And Isaac is following his dad, and it's not until he gets up the mountain that Isaac kind of looks around and goes, um, hey, Dad, I got the wood, you got the knife, you got the fire, but where is the lamb? Knowing what is going on, that is one of the most heartbreaking questions in all of Scripture. Where is the lamb? Because we know the answer, right? Isaac is the lamb. And now if it's not been bad enough, Abraham has to answer Isaac. And he reveals in his answer an astonishing statement of absolute and total trust in God. He says, God will provide for himself the lamb. God will provide for himself the lamb. Now, this is not an answer of deflection where you just throw it off on God. Anybody ever use God as an answer of deflection? If you're a parent, you have. Hey, Dad, why did God invent a platypus? I don't know. Ask him, right? We, 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 we don't know. So, so we throw it off on God. This, this is not one of those. This is where Abraham is telling Isaac, we are on this journey because God commanded us to be on this journey. And I am obeying God and His call and His command. And God has made many promises to me to which God and God alone must make happen. So in this situation then, God will provide for Himself because He's the only one who can. And God's command to Abraham then makes the provision of the Lamb God's responsibility. God's going to have to do something. And we're ready. We're waiting to see what he's going to do. But he gets to the top of the mountain and we're told again in great detail what is going. And and although the events are happening very quickly, it reads almost in slow motion. We're told that he builds the altar. And then it says he laid the wood. And then you notice those next two words? In order. Anybody who's ever built a fire knows you don't just throw it into the fire pit and light it. It don't work. If you want a fire to start, you've got to arrange the wood. And so here's Abraham arranging the wood. So why? So the fire would start. And he bounds Isaac, and Isaac is older, or excuse me, Isaac is younger, probably much faster and and, and, and much quicker. Yet he goes through with it. And, and, And he allows his dad to bind him. And in Jewish and rabbinical thought, this is not called the sacrifice of Isaac. This is called the binding of Isaac. 
And so just as, as Abraham had faith in God, Isaac had faith in his father that, that everything God, that he had told him was going to come to pass. And so we get to the end of verse 10. And there's an altar, there's a fire, and there's a bound sun, there's a knife. And we're thinking, time is running out, God. And it's in verse 11 that we see God's provision. The angel of the Lord calls out to him. And we're like, finally. Because everything is there. We see, we read Abraham reaching out his hand and took the knife. And look at what it says. To slaughter his son. I mean, it, it, Genesis doesn't sugarcoat it. To, to slaughter his son. And, and we see the movements. And I know it's usually depicted with Abraham with his hand over. I don't know if it's his hands here, if it's hands here. He's in process of slaughtering his son. And we hear a voice from heaven. And it's the same way, right? Verse 1 starts out, Abraham. And here we have in verse 11, Abraham, Abraham. Your name is called twice. It's usually more important than once. But look at what he says again. He responds the same way. Here I am. Where is he? When he says, here I am, where is he? He is exactly where God told him to be. He is on top of the mountain obeying God's command. Here I am, God, acting out in faith, doing what you have called me to do. I'm here, Lord. And we're stunned by that. And we're going, please, God, provide. Please, please provide. And we hear, it says, look, God speaks again. says, do not lay a hand on the boy, for I know that you fear God. And fearing God is equivalent to having faith and obeying God's commands. I know that you will obey me, and you will not withhold anything. If he would not withhold his son, his only son, the son whom he loved from God, what else is there to withhold? And God says, I know that you will not withhold anything from me. And when he lifts up his eyes, Abraham noticed that God indeed did provide for himself. He sees a ram caught in the thicket, and Isaac's question was answered, and Abraham's answer was confirmed. Where is the lamb the Lord will provide? There's the answer for Isaac, and Abraham's faith being confirmed. There is God. He is providing the lamb for us. So Abraham looks and he calls the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. Just as the Lord promised that he would. And then the story ends with the angel speaking again to Abraham, reaffirming the promises already made, reaffirming that Isaac would be the one to carry on the line, and the offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies. Your offspring shall all the nations of the earth. Be blessed because you obeyed my voice. In verse, <clears throat> and in verse 19, what we see is the answer to what Abraham told his servants in verse 5. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham returns to his young men with Isaac trailing behind. And they leave and they go to Beersheba. And there is where Abraham lives. He has passed the test. He withheld nothing from God. But we still don't have the answer to why this test. Why this test? And the answer is just two words. Our salvation. Our salvation. God is is preparing Israel and he is preparing us for how we will be saved. Genesis is the book of beginnings. And in the book of beginnings is the first. And in the book of beginnings is where you start laying out items and teachings to, to, to learn later. That, that first chapter, right? Uh, you know, in a, in a novel, you've got to reach out and grip the person. Kind of set up the story of what's going on, and and everything is worked out in in the end. And sometimes you flip back to chapter one when you're in chapter twenty to go, where was it? Oh yeah, that's where it was. It was in that little comment, and it understands. Genesis, the book of beginning, is teaching us so many things about God. We're being introduced to God. We're learning about God, and one of the things that He is teaching Israel that that will come later in us is how we will be saved. 
Genesis 3, after the fall, he says, Look for the one who will come who will crush the serpent. He tells us in Genesis 15, he says, Hey, Isaac is going to be born. He's going to be a son of promise. But beyond Isaac, you need to look for a son of promise. And we get to Genesis chapter 22, and we're told, look for a substitute. Look for a substitute. Because what we see then is the progression, is there's going to be one who is to come. We see that it's going to be the one who is to come is going to be the promised son. We see that the promised son is going to be a substitute. Because as we read Genesis 22, what we see is the ram dies instead of Isaac. The ram dies in place of Isaac so that Isaac and by extension all of Israel may live. The the ram dies so that Isaac lives and so that through his line and through Abraham's lines, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Look for The substitute. And the substitute is going to come from the most unlikely place that we can imagine. The substitute isn't going to come from a thicket. The substitute is going to come from heaven. The substitute is going to be God's only Son. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 in and of itself is a beautiful verse. John 3.16 coupled with Genesis chapter 22 becomes extraordinary. Because do you remember, do you you see the contrast of what happens in Genesis 22 with what happens in John 3? In Genesis chapter 22, the God who stopped Abraham from sacrificing his own son, or his son, his only son, the son whom he loves, and John 3.16 is the God, uh, God who does not stop his son, his own son, the son whom he loves from being offered up for our sins. In Genesis 22, God tells Abraham, no, don't do that. In John 3, God says, yes. I will allow my son to be the sacrifice for your sins. We keep reading, and we read in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, and, and following. It says, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who have believed, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. He put Christ forward so that he would be the substitute for us. He would be the substitute so that through his blood there is redemption. Look for the substitute. And then we're told in Romans chapter 8, if all of this is true, verse 31, what, what then shall we say? If this is true, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He goes on to say, so that it is God who justifies. He becomes the one who justifies and is the just, he is just and the justifier. God gives him up. What are we to say? What charge can we be brought against us? What can we say against the God who loved us so much that he gave us his only son as the substitute for our sins so that Christ may die so that we may live? Genesis 22 points us to our salvation. It is a story that tells us that we will be saved. And that we will be saved not through ourselves, but we will be saved by a substitute. When we go back and we read Isaac's question, where he says, Where is the Lamb? 
And we read in John where John the Baptist is preaching as we come to the Lord's table in just a few minutes and John the Baptist reaches out as he sees Jesus come and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this morning as we read Genesis 22 and we come to worship at the Lord's table, the question is simple. Do you see the Lamb? For in the bread and the juice, in His body and His blood, We have the answer to Isaac's question. Where is the lamb? The lamb was the one on the cross who died for our sins so that we might be saved, so that we might be redeemed, we might be justified. So this morning we can come and we can worship at his table. There's the lamb who died in my place, who died in your place. You've been listening to the Gary Talks About God podcast. Are you looking for a church? Well, Red Bank Missionary Baptist Church is a community of believers who exist to glorify God and see transformed lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can find us on the web at www.redbankmbc.com. Also, come visit us on Sunday at 8104 Red Bank Road in Germantown, North Carolina. Did you like this podcast? We put one out each and every week, so don't forget to subscribe. We hope this has been a blessing to you, and we thank you for listening.